So be be sure go back to read all these cutting articles, right? Yeah, keep the keywords. That's very very good. Okay, I think we need you know go further to uh this adventure. Yeah, so we will you know continue uh this kind of dialogue in the I can ask talks. I think every week we try to give something or deliver some message from different speakers from a different you know place. So thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Tao Li, and thank you, Tahek. It's very good to meet you. You know, on this I can ask. Yeah, uh, line talk. So we will continue for Tahek. Yeah, Tahek's talk is going to you know be micro and the nano. Yeah. Uh, actually, I know Professor Tahek for how many years? More than ten years, right? Yeah, exactly more than that. We're working together already fourteen years. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. We're already partners for fourteen years. So Professor Tahek was one of the uh big name, you know, in my mind, in man's field. He did a lot of nice work, and he never stopped, you know, to develop new things and to get, you know, conquer the new areas, the new fields. And today he's going to talk about story for sustainable. Development of goals and how micro and nano can help. Okay, Tahek, the stage is yours. The word is yours, please. Thank you, Alice. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, wonderful platform. Um, so, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. So, uh, after the uh, wonderful speech of Deji. Uh, from the atom to uh, the nanoscale, so uh, and even micro scale. So now I would like to bring you from the micro scale or nano micro scale to uh, uh, bigger scales, uh, including the city scale and even uh, uh, more. So um, so as you see, the the, the title of my pre presentation is Sustainable Development Goals: How Micro and Nano Technology Can Help. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge my uh, uh, institute, the ESICOM Laboratory, a joint uh, laboratory involving CNRS and uh, Université Gustave Eiffel. So uh, this is uh, the, a picture of the whole uh, group. Uh, and uh, uh, below uh, the names of the faculty uh, who are close collaborators, uh, research engineers, PhD students, postdocs, and master students. Uh, special thanks to uh, external collaborators, uh, including Professor Dia Khalil and Associate Professor Yasser Sabri from Ain Shams University in Egypt, Prof. Chun Yu from NTU Singapore, Prof. Chen Hong Sui from University of Minnesota in USA, Prof. Daniel B. Sens, ESPCI friends, and a special acknowledgments to my seniors who uh, contributed in my, my training, uh, especially Prof. Francois Bayeux. Uh, who, uh, who was my PhD supervisor and Professor Fujita from the University of Tokyo. I spent three years in his lab. So the sponsors of uh, the different projects uh, are, are given below. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, a picture of the campus of, uh, I will give a very short introduction about our university. So uh, today I'm speaking from uh, this uh, building, which looks like a keyboard of a computer with the mouse here. So I'm in the last building now in my office, speaking from there. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a school of electrical engineering named ICI and is part of the University Gustave Eiffel. Uh, and uh, we are working together with uh, our neighbors uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, wonderful projects uh, targeting uh, to, to, to have some uh, valuable contribution in, sustainable, uh, in sustainability. So, uh, the University Gustave Eiffel is a newborn. Uh, it was uh, established in January 2020, uh, and it's a result of a merging of six institutions. So uh, it was given the name of Gustave Eiffel, uh, who, uh, who uh, had several contributions, uh, among which uh, uh, building this uh, uh, metallic infrastructure, which is known as the Eiffel Tower, and many others. So uh, we are located uh, here in between the very center of Paris, where you can uh, uh, visit uh, uh, Paris area and also uh, the Euro Disneyland. We are halfway in between. 
and uh, uh, conveniently located uh, from the two airports. Uh, when uh, we have flights again, you, you, you'll be able to, to visit Paris and hope to, to, to go through uh, this university. So it's a newborn, but uh, with uh, some uh, centuries of history. So this is among the alumni of uh, uh, my school. So including Marcel Dassault, uh, more uh, than 100 years ago, the founder of Dassault Group. Uh, uh, more recently, uh, Jan Lequin, who, who got the uh, 2019 Turing Award for his contribution uh, in deep learning. He was considered as uh, among the fathers of deep learning. And uh, among my own students who, uh, who had some uh, experience in establishing companies uh, related to MEMS. So we have Jean-Michel Karam, who was alumni in 1993, and uh, uh, Bassam Sadani, uh, who, who took his PhD from, uh, from my university, and uh, he's a founder and CTO of uh, Cyber Systems. So uh, our associate partner, the School of Civil Engineering, is even older. Uh, it was established in the 18th century. And uh, some alumni of this uh, school uh, include famous scientists like uh, Navier, Coriolis, Fresnel, and Cauchy. So uh, the uh, university strategy uh, is built along three pillars. So one of them where we have most of our contribution is the uh, smart and digital cities where we have intensive use of urban sensors. But also the resource efficiency uh, uh, city uh, uh, which uh, leads to uh, uh, inc increasing number of opportunities to uh, make something new. Uh, I will elaborate on examples of our contribution in this area and also the safe and efficient uh, city. So the, the key word is the sustainable city. Sustainable is uh, the, the most important keyword in this frame. So the ambition of our university is inventing the city of tomorrow. So uh, the context uh, is the uh, anthropo Anthropocene and uh, the, uh, the uh, resulting uh, recent sustainable development goals. So those who are not familiar with the sustainable development goals, it was uh, an initiative adopted by uh, United uh, Nations in 2015. It was adopted actually in Paris and uh, they establish an agenda towards 2030 to, uh, uh, to uh, take actions uh, in order to, uh, to address several, uh, several of those goals. There are 17 goals. And uh, the context is that the world population is increasing, the urbanization is increasing, more and more people live in cities and cities are growing inside. Uh, in the same time, uh, the, we have intensive agriculture, industrialization, pollution, and climate change. And uh, uh, what is decreasing is the land resources, the water resources, the food resources, and the air quality, biodiversity, and life expectancy. So uh, it's time to do something, or at least to try. Uh, and uh, I will give uh, in my talk some illustration about uh, the sustainable cities and community, which is goal number 11, zero hunger, the goal number two, and clean water and sanitation, goal number six. So uh, actually, uh, it's a contribution to, to, uh, uh, to have a, a better uh, optimization of uh, uh, fundamental natural resources for life, which includes water, air, food, and soil. So uh, in this area, how micro and nano can help? So uh, I try to give uh, some uh, illustration of uh, this uh, big challenge. So uh, in, in, uh, in my university, we established ties between electrical engineering and civil engineering. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, all, it's became almost natural to establish a collaboration between electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, but civil engineering is, is, rather, uh, uh, is not so common. And uh, it looks like it's opposed worlds. So uh, we are talking about nano and micro scale uh, for uh, nano engineering. And uh, they are considering much larger scales. We are working in a clean environment. They're working in rather dirty environments. So uh, it looks like impossible collaboration, but uh, we, we established this uh, project uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, its name is Sense City. 
So, and it's, uh, uh, it, it uh, takes benefits of two world-class experimental platforms. One of them is, uh, is uh, to make fast prototyping of MEMS and nanosensors. And the, the other one is a climatic chamber, which allow us make experiments in uh, under controlled climate environment. So uh, this uh, chamber is movable and it has 20 meters uh, lateral dimension, eight meter long. We can control sun, uh, uh, rain, uh, temperature, pollution, and so on. And this, uh, uh, this ensemble uh, allow us to uh, 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 provide a kind of TRL booster. TRL stands for technology readiness level. So uh, once we, we, we make a prototype, we, we are able to test it in this uh, controlled environment before uh, deploy, deployment at larger scale uh, at the city scale. So uh, before elaborating, I would like to, to go back a little bit, uh, uh, a flashback to the late 80s. So at that time, uh, I, I was, uh, I was uh, pursuing my studies, st starting uh, my PhD project in the School of Electrical Engineers. Uh, they, 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 they offered me uh, this uh, topic of uh, working on mechanical engineering, actually. Looks uh, strange for me because uh, my background was physics and uh, uh, optoelectronics, actually. And uh, this is among the very first papers that uh, I had to read, and it was uh, really fascinating and inspiring. So I found that uh, uh, Dr. Kurt Peterson uh, is uh, in, the, in the list of the next uh, uh, speakers in this uh, ICANN talk. So I'm uh, very uh, glad to, to, to see uh, his name uh, as, as, uh, in, the, in the panel. And I took uh, this uh, sentence from the abstract of his, uh, his paper, the ultimate goal of developing a broad range of inexpensive batch fabricated high performance sensors. So uh, I started uh, this, uh, this uh, to try to contribute in this area. So uh, I, I made uh, uh, some contribution to uh, kind of innovative sensors at that time, a microphone based on silicon and a gyroscope based on silicon. And at that time I had no idea about what would be the, uh, uh, the next uh, phase of uh, using those kind of MEMS sensors. And actually it came quite fast because in uh, uh, 1993, we had the uh, first accelerometers introduced in airbag systems and it had a lot of uh, uh, impact saving lives for, uh, for uh, safety uh, systems in the car industry. And then uh, uh, a little bit later, we had the uh, uh, a big, uh, another big uh, uh, application area of MEMS, uh, which addressed the smartphones. And we have this uh, accelerometers from ST Microelectronics into the smartphones. And uh, sometimes later in 2013, we started having some uh, applications of those uh, MEMS sensors in smart cities. So smart sensors was used in order to, uh, to have a quite of a, a very large scale uh, uh, assessment of uh, like seismic events. Uh, and uh, some uh, strategy at that time was, were, were based on crowdsourcing. So uh, taking benefit of, uh, of information available from a large number of smartphone users in order to, to get value from uh, those data, a huge amount of data. So uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, a sustainable and smart city is uh, to collect and uh, uh, use information at the city scale for understanding the city metabolism and also providing useful services and uh, also uh, establishing a new, new uh, business and new economy. So uh, there are uh, different strategies for uh, acquiring those data. Uh, so uh, it's uh, either using those uh, mobile uh, or IoT systems, including uh, smartphones or cars and wearables, but also deploying sensors along existing infrastructure. Uh, so uh, I will uh, go through a couple of examples in this area. So when you see uh, the landscape of sensors and the, the billions uh, or hundreds of billions of those sensors, which are already available in, uh, in smartphones. So you, you, there, there are some uh, uh, 
uh, forecast uh, that uh, predict that we have more than 20 uh, sensors quite soon. But uh, what is uh, uh, missing today, uh, most of the sensors that are on the smartphones are physical sensors. There are almost no chemical sensors. So the next step would be a, a gas sensor or chemical sensors in general. So it looks like there is an opportunity here to uh, make something uh, a novel, uh, which will open the door for plenty of uh, new applications. So uh, for the, the smart city, uh, there is this uh, ambition uh, to achieve ubiquitous sensing. Ubiquitous sensing means measuring everything everywhere. So uh, this is uh, uh, so uh, an illustration of uh, a digital representation of uh, of a city, so uh, it's a, a, a representation of the pollution uh, by uh, NOx at uh, the uh, uh, at the scale of the whole Paris, so which is a territory of almost uh, 10 kilometers in lateral dimension. But the uh, uh, thing here is that the spatial resolution is uh, three meters, so. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, achievement has been uh, uh, produced uh, by merging uh, uh, different technologies and uh, uh, including uh, modeling with uh, uh, input data which are which comes from measurements including weather uh, and also uh, the uh, traffic the traffic of the car and uh, you you see here a couple of reference sensors that has been used uh, for the purpose of validating the results, uh, the quantitative results uh, of uh, this uh, uh, experience. So uh, these days you cannot travel to France, but uh, this is an opportunity for having some sightseeing, virtual sightseeing, to visit uh, famous places in uh, Champs Elysees and the surroundings. So uh, the digital city uh, is not necessarily uh, always. Uh, this kind of representations. So in the previous example, uh, NOx was the uh, only uh, uh, parameters which was monitored. Uh, but in, in practice, there is a need to monitor much more than, than this uh, parameter. So there is a huge number of chemical species. If we stick just with this problem of air quality, there, there should be a, a lot of different sensors and, and this is uh, uh, looks like an, an, an attainable goal to fabricate all those sensors, integrate them into smartphones or IoT devices. So it should be another strategy to achieve this kind of, uh, uh, of measurements. So analytical chemistry is one option. And there was this uh, wonderful uh, uh, achievements from uh, Michigan University uh, of this uh, micro gas chromatography, which is uh, uh, compact enough and uh, uh, able to screen up to 19 chemicals uh, with the same device at very low concentration levels. Uh, however, uh, it looks like this, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, technology uh, will, not be, uh, will not be very suitable uh, if, we, if we think about its potential integration into smartphones. There are some uh, physical limitations that uh, makes me at least think that this is uh, not uh, not very suitable. So uh, so let's dream a little bit. So Alice mentioned about the dream. Uh, the dream is not sufficient, but uh, at least there there should be a dream at the beginning. And uh, uh, how about the next generation smartphones with new capabilities of chemical analysis in order to provide answer to this kind of questions? Am I breathing fresh air? Is this bread gluten free? Uh, is this fruit organic, and, and so on. A lot of uh, questions that uh, requires uh, chemical analysis. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, chromatography is an option, but uh, uh, it suffers from uh, the fact that there is a need for taking a sample, injecting this sample into a chromatography column, making the analysis. And this looks like uh, not uh, very suitable. Uh, however, on the other hand, if you take optics and optical spectroscopy is another option for analytical chemistry, it can be the, the analysis can be done remotely. So no need for taking a sample. And uh, this makes things a priori 
uh, much convenient and one can dream about uh, uh, integration into a smartphone or into a portable devices. So uh, Alice mentioned those uh, three keywords. Uh, maybe one of them is not the most appropriate, but uh, uh, I would like to tell you a story of one of my former students uh, who had a dream and ambition and persistence because it took him quite a long time to achieve uh, his dream. Uh, so, uh, so these students came from Egypt, the, the university I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, Ein Shams University. So uh, he came to France to, uh, to uh, prepare his PhD and now he's the CTO of uh, Cyware Systems and uh, the, uh, the product line uh, called Neospectra. So this is a photo together uh, with him and uh, Frédéric Parti. At that time, we were visiting Japan uh, in the frame of a research collaboration. And uh, uh, Frédéric Marty is, uh, is uh, uh, one of our Clinom engineers. And uh, he is very talented in uh, using uh, uh, the deep reactive ion etching technology. And he's probably among the first uh, uh, engineers to achieve the uh, aspect ratio exceeding 100 to 1 uh, uh, using uh, DRIE, and it was proven to be a key enabling achievements, especially for optical maps. So uh, uh, using uh, uh, optical spectroscopy uh, uh, to, uh, as an option for, uh, for analytical chemistry requires integration, requires miniaturization of uh, uh, those uh, typical uh, laboratory instruments used in, in analytical chemistry, typical uh, cost is 50K, typical dimension is 50 centimeter. And uh, the idea is to uh, bring them much smaller uh, in order to uh, change a paradigm in analytical chemistry. So rather than bringing the sample to the lab, we can take the lab to the sample and make on-site analysis like uh, a sensor. So uh, uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the achievements that was uh, obtained after a couple of years of intensive uh, R&D. So uh, this is, uh, to, uh, to our best knowledge, the smallest FTIR spectrometer uh, that was uh, developed based on uh, MEMS uh, technology. So, uh, so because we have a wide audience today, I will just come back to some fundamentals about how uh, an FTIR spectrometer works. So basically it can be seen as a Michelson interferometer where you have input light here. The light will be split into two different paths. It will, be, uh, it will reflect here after a travel range L. And in the other part, it will have another range which will be L plus X. And the second uh, mirror is movable with this uh, uh, variable distance X. So uh, at the end, we will have interference between those two uh, light paths. And uh, so some basic formula will, can show us that uh, we will uh, detect at the end photo detector here, a signal which will be uh, a kind of a cosine of uh, this uh, uh, distance X. So then if we make, if this is, uh, this reasoning holds true for a monochromatic light, if we take a wide band light, we need to make the sum over the different uh, 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 frequencies uh, and making the cosine transform show you that the uh, spectral uh, information can be retrieved after making the Fourier transform of this signal. So X here, uh, which appears in blue, is appears as a variable. So uh, it means that we need to move this mirror we need to move it, and while moving this mirror, we acquire data. Uh, we acquire this kind of signal uh, coming from here. And uh, after the uh, integral or the FFT, the Fourier transform, we get the spectrum. So this is the operation principle. So to implement this into MEMS, so we need to have a beam splitter. We need to have a movable mirror. The mirror can be moved by a MEMS actuator. And then, uh, as you can see here, while moving the uh, the mirror, we get an interferogram, and then making the FFT gives the, the spectrum. So this is uh, the, the uh, main uh, uh, idea. So uh, in the theoretical uh, uh, formula was uh, showing that we need to have an, some uh, 
from zero to infinity, but uh, in practic practically we have a limited travel range. We'll not be able to move this mirror to infinity. So uh, especially we are using MEMS technology, so we have a limited travel range and this will eventually affect the uh, spectral resolution. So this is a first uh, uh, limitation of uh, uh, this uh, technology, but even uh, with this limitation, we were able to produce a one millimeter motion using an electrostatic actuation, which, uh, which is not uh, quite, uh, quite easy. Uh, and with this travel range, we're able to have this uh, wavelength resolution of uh, typically eight nanometers. Uh, in this uh, spectral range in the near infrared. So there are a lot of uh, uh, technological uh, details that uh, uh, we, uh, ha we had to tackle uh, in order to uh, have uh, uh, excellent optical uh, uh, optical performance, uh, like the sidewall verticality, the uh, roughness, and uh, all what matters for uh, optical uh, devices. So let's see now how this optical spectroscopy can be implemented to make gas sensing. So uh, uh, typically what we have to do is uh, uh, have a, a wide band uh, light source, send it through a certain path L, and then we collect uh, the spectrum of this light. So uh, according to the Beer-Lambert law, we will have absorption, which will happen here where we have the gas, and uh, the absorption will be uh, uh, will be dependent on the gas concentration, the specific absorptivity of the light, and the optical length. So the absorptivity of the light is a function of, uh, of the wavelength, and it's a kind of signature or a spectral signature of different uh, materials, and it can be used for identifying those materials through their spectra. So we have typical dips like here. So we, this is the example of CO2. Uh, in the spectral range from uh, in the near infrared. So we can recognize CO2 uh, through this uh, spectral signature. And the am amount of CO2 is the uh, depth of this uh, dip. Uh, so uh, if you consider that uh, uh, different gases uh, can absorb with their specific signatures in the, uh, in the infrared, in the mid infrared, so at the end, you come up with one device which can serve as a spectral sensor to measure and identify uh, uh, different gases simultan simultaneously. This is an example where you, get, you can get information about five different gases through a single uh, uh, spectrum. And it takes uh, uh, seconds to, to, to get this information is quite fast, which is not the case for chromatography techniques, uh, uh, for instance. So, uh, so what is uh, the uh, the uh, uh, other uh, uh, performance requirements which is needed to achieve ubiquitous sensing, meaning uh, uh, being able to measure different uh, gases or different chemicals uh, using the same device? So one ad one advantage of FTIR Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy is that it covers a quite wide range, and in this range of the infrared. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, gases absorbing uh, significantly, and this can be seen as, a, uh, as an advantage uh, as a, with a single device, even if the wavelength uh, resolution is quite limited, we are able to see uh, the corresponding signals. Uh, just for comparison, uh, uh, the, com uh, the other alternative of using tun tunable diode laser spectroscopy offers a, a much uh, better uh, wavelength resolution, a much better uh, signal to noise ratio, but it is limited to a spectral range of 100 nanometer, while uh, the FTIR uh, gives a spectral range uh, up to uh, six micrometers, which is uh, uh, typically 50 times uh, more. So it's seen as a real advantage for ha having a, a single spectral sensor, uh, which is versat versatile enough. So uh, if we want to increase this uh, wavelength resolution, there are a couple of tricks. I will just give an illustration about this one. We, we saw in the, previous, uh, uh, in the previous slide that we have to deal with this limitation of not being able to move the mirror more than a certain distance. So uh, uh, what we, we did here in this uh, uh, work uh, published quite recently is revisiting the Fourier transform 
and actually uh, duplicating or uh, multiplying the different uh, optical paths uh, using this, uh, this trick. So uh, uh, basically what we obtain is we obtain different sections, different portions of the uh, interferogram, uh, as you can see from this different four colors. And uh, uh, the, uh, the way it is obtained is using the same actuator to move different uh, mirrors which are shifted uh, one to another. And at the end, we are able to reconstruct uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the signal as if uh, there, there was a, a 4x increase of the optical path. So this is the evidence of uh, the proof of concept. So starting from eight nanometer resolution for a single stage, we were able to demonstrate a two nanometer uh, resolution using four stages. So uh, the uh, one of the impact is, is uh, to have a much better uh, identification of gases. So this is an illustration uh, used with the methane. So a much more challenging uh, use case is uh, uh, dealing with volatile organic compounds. Volatile organic compounds are, are found in much, much uh, uh, less uh, concentration levels. And in the same time, they are absorbing uh, uh, in the almost the same, uh, the same uh, wavelength range. So it's very challenging to make the difference between, for example, benzene and toluene uh, because they are absorbing uh, uh, in a very similar wavelength range. So regarding the first challenge, we, we were able to uh, to uh, reach a lower limit of detection below uh, a 1 ppm or even below 0 0.1 ppm. Regarding the second one, we, have, uh, we are working hard to solve this issue. And the solution is uh, machine learning, learning algorithms that has been uh, already implemented for other application and that we are uh, uh, trying to, uh, to uh, uh, implement for this uh, use case. So now uh, uh, I, I will move to another uh, uh, application, which is spectroscopy on solid media. So rather than gas, what we can do is, uh, is uh, having the light source and the spectrometer on the same hardware. So we send light and the light is, is coming back. So uh, in case we are dealing with a solid medium, so we'll have a light matter interaction, which will uh, take place at the interface here between uh, air and the solid medium. And we can uh, get, uh, we can implement uh, absorption spectroscopy and uh, identify or even quantify uh, uh, the, uh, the chemicals uh, in, the, in the solid material. So uh, if, we, if we think about this, its implementation into a smartphone, then we need both the light source and the spectrometer. So we can make similar rezoning like a flash and the camera so the flash, instead of having the flash, we need to have a broadband infrared light source. And among the candidates of this kind of light source, we can have a, a, a thermal light source, just heating and taking advantage of the black body radiation to produce a, a, a broad enough light source. And what will be the camera would be the, the spectrometer. It would be our dispersive element. Uh, so we use for this purpose, we used uh, black silicon as a highly uh, emissive uh, material. And uh, recently uh, uh, we, we also tested uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, which also provide uh, interesting uh, potential. So uh, even smaller than the previous version of the spectrometer is this latest version, which is called Neospectra Micro. So uh, it's no more a handheld spectrometer, it's a finger held spectrometer. It is uh, less than two centimeters in lateral dimension. And uh, with this kind of dimension, we can think seriously about uh, application into, into uh, integration into smartphones. So uh, this has been uh, uh, implemented by uh, making a kind of uh, a huge effort in, of, in integration and in the same time changing the paradigm, uh, moving from fiber optic interface into free space light interface. So the free space light interface uh, allowed to simplify uh, drastically uh, the, uh, the architecture of this uh, spectrometer. So uh, this is the first video to show uh, uh, 
to show uh, an application or a demo of uh, a proof of concept of having this kind of spectrometer suitable uh, for integ integration into a smartphone. So uh, it's not a real integration, but it uh, uh, it's gives uh, an idea of, about the potential. Um, so the, as you can see, this is the way it has been implemented. Uh, modifying the case of an iPhone, adding the uh, spectrometer chip together with uh, 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 with a light source, and then uh, using it to as a demo for demo purposes, together with a yes or no application that will be used to identify a certain uh, solid material. It has been used to identify uh, caffeine free and uh, coffee with caffeine. Uh, and this is uh, the results. So it takes a couple of seconds to scan the surface of the solid material. And the response is, yes, there is caffeine. And then uh, the, the demo that you can see in YouTube, uh, you can find it easily in YouTube, Neospectra Micro in Action. Uh, the second sample has no caffeine and the uh, answer will be uh, no caffeine is just yes or no based on uh, uh, classification. So there was another uh, example is to test the uh, gluten, whether there's a gluten or not in, uh, in this sample. And uh, there was another uh, uh, application that was uh, developed for this purpose. Okay. So uh, then based on this, uh, one can seriously consider that uh, a spectrometer has a potential for a chemical analysis based on, uh, on the smartphone. And there was a couple of uh, highlights uh, towards the, this perspective. But uh, looks like smartphone uh, industry is not ready yet. So uh, for that purpose, we moved to other path uh, uh, in IoT. So there are plenty of opportunities for IoT uh, to develop portable devices. And uh, I will illustrate uh, in the few, uh, a few examples addressing some issues about food and agriculture using uh, this uh, spectrometer. So uh, for example, uh, uh, this is an example of uh, uh, fraud, detecting fraud or mislabeling. So uh, if, you, if you go to the market or uh, if you see uh, this kind of fish, uh, you should be very expert to, to, to tell whether it is salmon or trout or salmon trout. So, uh, so the idea here was to, to use Neospectra to give the answer immediately. So uh, based on classification and machine learning uh, algorithm that has been developed. Uh, so uh, after the model, so uh, all the data of salmon trout comes in, into this cluster, whether the samlet goes into this cluster. So it's quite, uh, uh, immediate to, to, to get the answer whether it is uh, this kind of fish or another one. So this uh, has been also demonstrated for another kind of fish where you have sole here and lemon sole. So uh, the cluster for sole is, is here where the lemon sole are there. So, uh, so the, in order to, to get this kind of uh, results is, uh, is typical of machine learning uh, uh, algorithm implementation. So you have a population of uh, well-known samples that you collect the spectra and uh, collecting the spectra uh, you you have uh, you you can also uh, take reference uh, instruments to to uh, characterize those uh, uh, those uh, samples and then based on this you build a database and uh, you develop the the, the model and uh, then you validate uh, uh, using uh, uh, unknown uh, samples so uh, this has been uh, uh, developed for multiple applications. So uh, rather than classification, there are also a potential for quantification. So this is another example of screening milk content contents for precision agriculture. So uh, here, uh, the idea was to retrieve the contents of uh, fats, uh, the contents of meats in terms of fats, protein, and lactose. And you can see from these results, the uh, uh, R square is, uh, is, uh, is very good. And with, a, with very low concentrations, uh, with very low errors in the uh, concentration prediction, below 0.1%. Uh, 
So uh, this is uh, another uh, illustration of uh, uh, optimization of uh, feed in, in precision agriculture. Maybe you, didn't, you don't hear the sound, uh, right? Uh, you can't hear the sound, so maybe you can just catch this if you want to view the, the video and hear the sound later. So the idea is to, uh, to have the uh, on-site uh, analysis of the feed of the animals to, to, to have a, a better uh, idea about their nutrition and also make correlation about the quality of the milk that they produce and there is room for optimization. So that was the main message from this uh, video. So, uh, so in more general, uh, a food scanner, how it works. So uh, there is a first step, as you understood, to build a model. So for this purpose, first, we, we need to build a portable device. So this is uh, what we call the scanner. So it's a portable device that is embedding the uh, spectrometer. So uh, his, it, it is used for uh, quantifying the nutri nutritional value of wheat. So uh, basically protein and moisture. So uh, there is a first step uh, of training and acquire, ac acquiring spectra and uh, having uh, reference methods, uh, means laboratory grade uh, methods to uh, analyze and get, get, give the uh, uh, very precise value of protein and moisture for all those samples that have been used for training. And then at the end, we can go to the field and, uh, uh, you, uh, and use the, uh, the model and uh, uh, use the scanner, uh, taking a sample, put it here, on this uh, area, a sample of uh, uh, wheat, and then uh, shine the light and in a few seconds get the results on the smartphone. So this is a, a, a general uh, a method, uh, meaning also that uh, if you have a given application, there is a need to build the corresponding mod model and then uh, uh, validate it uh, uh, and uh, check also the performance uh, based on uh, comparison with uh, with reference methods. Uh, so there are plenty of uh, uh, applications uh, that uh, relates to food industry. As you can imagine, uh, there's an infinity of, uh, of options. And uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, attempt for classification is uh, uh, food availability, food quality, authenticity, tr and trading efficiency. Trading efficiency here in this case, depending on the value of uh, protein and moisture, the cost uh, of the transaction will not be the same. So it can be very, uh, very useful uh, to make a transaction uh, based on having this portable uh, system. Uh, but uh, more uh, importantly, it can be used uh, as an efficient tool to uh, uh, address the, uh, the uh, issues of food waste. Uh, and also optimize uh, the whole supply chain of food in order to minimize this food waste. Food waste is really uh, uh, an, an issue. In Europe only, we have 88 million tons of food which go to, go to waste each year. And uh, there is room for progress and for optimization at different levels. So the food freshness uh, can be uh, double checked. So for example, you have a label here of course, in this case, you should not eat it. This is already more than two years ago. But uh, uh, sometimes it's, you exceeded by a few days the uh, expiration date. And uh, uh, you, 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 can, you can be tempted to throw it away. But if you have a device that will allow you to check uh, its uh, real freshness, uh, then it can be really useful. So. Uh, it can be used either for meat or fruit and, and vegetables ripeness. And also it can be used through the whole uh, supply chains, including at the plant themselves to, uh, to help taking decision uh, about uh, the optimal time to harvest. The optimal time to harvest depending on the maturity of the, uh, the fruits and the vegetables, and also depending on the demand on the market. 
uh, it could be a very useful tool for uh, optimization purposes. So there are plenty of other uh, applications and here they are classified into either smart food or precision agriculture. We, in precision agriculture, we saw uh, the, the video that we, you, you did not hear the sound is uh, related to animal feed analysis and optimization. Uh, there is also a very important area, which is the soil analysis. So uh, in, in soil analysis, there is a kind of win-win uh, 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 configuration that could be found if a farmer can have a tool to uh, have uh, monitoring of the uh, fertilizers and uh, also uh, other chemicals that he use uh, in, the, in his exploitation. So uh, minimizing the use of fertilizers has not only economic impact for the farmer because he will, not, he will save money not using too much of those expensive fertilizers. And also it will have, ha it will have an ecological impact because those fertilizers are known to impact the groundwater and eventually uh, we, we will have a lot of uh, those, uh, even uh, not only fertilizers, but also pesticides uh, in, the, in the fresh uh, water. And eventually it will have uh, some uh, health impact because the, uh, uh, this uh, water will be safe. So uh, we come out to, this bring us to another challenge, which is the water a water global challenge. So we mainly uh, need to address uh, two issues, the water quality that uh, we mentioned uh, uh, in the previous slide, and also the water scarcity. So I will go through uh, two examples of uh, uh, having, uh, taking advantage of existing infrastructure, especially the drinking water network to, uh, uh, to have, to address the two issues of water contam contamination and water leakage. Water leakage is also a very uh, uh, important issue because uh, a significant portion of the produced fresh water is lost just because of leakage in distribution infrastructures. So the, the range is, is, uh, is very important. 6% up to 63% in some country of the water is lost. So uh, there are challenges, uh, uh, these challenges, uh, uh, can take benefit of uh, suitable sensors that will be able to measure multiple physical, chemical, and biological parameters. And then uh, with those sensors, th there, there will be an opportunity to make mapping. So I will give just uh, an illustration about uh, how uh, this can be implemented. So uh, there are commercially available multi-parameter sensors, but they are very expensive. So if you can if you consider implementing, deploying those kind of sensor into a water network, it will be too expensive. But if you don't put enough sensors, you, have, you will not have enough data, and then you will not be able to make efficient monitoring of your uh, water network. So uh, uh, MEMS can, be, can provide a solution uh, decreasing the unit cost of those multi-parameter sensors. And we had this European project that was ended uh, two years ago where uh, we, we, we worked uh, towards this challenge and came out with uh, a, a MEMS platform, uh, which is one centimeter in lateral dimensions, and embedding nine different uh, type of sensors, including all those guys, four physical sensors and five chemical sensors. Uh, and uh, it was uh, a first uh, 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 demonstration of uh, uh, integrating uh, uh, nanomaterials onto a, a MEMS platform. And those nanomaterials were uh, functionalized carbon nanotubes, uh, each of them with different functionalizations so that it will be sensitive uh, more or less to one of these guys. Uh, so uh, I will just give an, a fast illustration about this technology upscaling. So as you know, uh, uh, using MEMS, uh, MEMS uh, technology allows you to produce a large number of devices from a single wafer. So uh, uh, having a batch of 25 wafers allows you to have more than 1000 chips. So then you need to package them and deploy them uh, into, uh, into the, uh, package them with electronics and uh, uh, wireless communication, even energy harvesting cap capabilities. So all those blocks has been, have been uh, uh, developed. And at the end, B 
before deploying at the, uh, in in a real uh, 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 water infrastructures, we we started using our uh, Sand City uh, uh, climatic chamber, which has uh, a water loop to uh, to test the capabilities of those sensors, and then at the end, it was uh, the proof of concept was validated through deployment in a, in a city in uh, southern Europe. It was Almada in Portugal. Uh, the uh, operator of the water network was a partner in uh, this uh, European R&D project. So uh, this is uh, uh, another video which shows uh, uh, a demonstration of about how it can be useful. Oh, so all those dots are sensors. So you can imagine so that uh, acquisition can be done here uh, uh, at, uh, at, at different times. And based on this information and a reverse modeling, uh, there is a, a possibility to reconstruct the time resolved uh, uh, concentration of, uh, uh, in this case, chlorine. So as you can see, the red colors indicate the highest concentration of chlorine. And you can see how they spread over the network. So if a, a water manager has this tool into his hands, will be able to call his teams to decide to close at those different locations before the chlorine spread out through uh, the, uh, the, the network. So uh, another uh, issue about uh, water is the uh, uh, water scarcity. So uh, this is a, a map showing uh, the, uh, uh, on, on the left side, the uh, regions, the arid regions, so those uh, areas which suffers from water scarcity, so the darkest uh, are the worst uh, in, in this uh, in this area, including uh, Australia here. And in the in the uh, in the lower map, you have the solar irradiation uh, map with a maximum of irradiation in uh, almost the same area. And also, uh, it is uh, uh, worth mentioning that the water amount uh, in the atmosphere. So there is water in the air available, and it's equivalent to the total fresh water and unpolluted water in air. So uh, there is a huge potential of, uh, uh, of, uh, of water that can be harvested from the air. So, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, an area of dew water harvesting because uh, we need to take, uh, to collect this water from the atmosphere. And uh, we are working uh, together with our partner, Professor Daniel Bessens uh, in ESPCI in Paris. And he's also pr president of a nonprofit organization which is uh, specialized in dew water. They implemented a lot of uh, uh, plants uh, over the world to uh, harvest uh, the dew uh, and the uh, rainwater. But uh, most of the time there is no rain, so they rely mainly on dew. Uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, proven to be very efficient as it provides uh, vital uh, resources to uh, villages uh, in uh, some arid regions. So uh, uh, there is a huge amount of water available in the air. So it is estimated to uh, more than uh, 12,000 kilometer, cubic kilometer of water available. But in order to take this water, there is a need and there is an opportunity to develop efficient water harvesting technologies. So, uh, and uh, it's, it's inspired by nature because many insects, for example, in the desert, they, they are able to survive and they know how to collect the water, uh, this dew water. And uh, uh, there are those uh, reports uh, starting from the, the 90s uh, which uh, is uh, uh, raising an interest in this area. And there is uh, this fantastic book from Daniel Bissens, uh, which describe it's a recent book, which describe the latest uh, progress in this area. There are a lot of uh, uh, fascinating physics uh, uh, and uh, uh, knowledge that I found in, in this book. So uh, radiative cooling, uh, we, we saw uh, we saw this topic in uh, one of the last uh, speeches of this I can uh, I can talks uh, uh, series by uh, Professor Liang Binghu from Maryland, when he presented us the uh, magic wood, uh, and uh, one one application of radiative cooling was to cool the uh, the, the buildings. So in this case, uh, uh, it can be used for uh, dew water collections, 
uh, and the, the principle is that uh, we need to make a, 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 the surface cooler than the uh, environment so that uh, condensation might occur. Uh, so then uh, uh, there is another requirement uh, for the surface to be efficient for water collection. So this is an illustration about uh, the natural wipers. So here you see that uh, in, in the left uh, photo that uh, some uh, droplets fall and they are eventually can be collected while others remain pinned to the surface. And this is an issue to be tackled. So that's to have efficient water collection. So the water needs to be leave the surface to be collected and uh, give uh, 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 an area for uh, additional new droplets to uh, condensate and have a very efficient water collection. So uh, uh, here there is another video that uh, shows some uh, st a strategy to, uh, to have this happens faster. Uh, so on the right side of the figure, it's uh, a material which has been structured so that grooves will uh, actually uh, amplify this uh, collection efficiency, while the same material without grooves leads to just condensation and growth of droplets, and those droplets are not falling. So, uh, so there is room for optimization, uh, and uh, uh, why not considering using metasurfaces? So uh, as you know, metasurfaces are uh, surfaces that has been engineered to have to exhibit better properties than uh, natural materials. And uh, here we, 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 we can see two examples uh, uh, regarding wetting properties that can be uh, engineered better than those that you can find in nature. Uh, the contact angle can be engineered at values uh, uh, approaching 180 degrees. And the reflectance also is another property, optical property, that can be uh, brought uh, 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 nearly uh, perfect, uh, approaching 100%. So uh, these are two different properties, wetting and optical properties. And uh, in the case of uh, dew water, we need to optimize both together on the same surface. So it's really challenging and it's also an opportunity uh, to use uh, some uh, materials. So this is an, a well-known material, which is called black silicon. As you can see, it is black uh, uh, to the naked eye. It looks black, but in the same times, it can be made super hydrophobic. Uh, and uh, we, we, But we need to look more in detail about the meaning of this uh, super hydrophobicity in the context of uh, dew water harvesting. So uh, the, the, the idea is to produce a water panel rather than an energy uh, panel based on silicon and uh, taking advantage of this uh, black silicon which whose um, micro and nanostructure is favorable not only for the optical properties uh, but also to the wetting properties. So then uh, the uh, ultimate goal will be to have uh, uh, water panels similar to uh, energy panels based on silicon or even single panels that will have dual functionalities uh, for harvesting energy in daytime and harvesting water in the nighttime. Uh, so uh, we, we have a project with uh, a Professor Daniel Bessens, also involving uh, Professor Chan Hong Sui from Minnesota. And we have a postdoc, uh, Dr. Xiaoyi Liu, come, came from uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences with us since almost two years working in this project. So uh, the first property is to have uh, high emissivity. And this emissivity has to uh, be uh, uh, in, the, in the infrared. And it, it, by uh, optimizing uh, 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 the black silicon, we were able to produce uh, this kind of ultra broadband and ultra black silicon. Uh, ultra broadband over a, a quite wide uh, uh, bandwidth uh, uh, exceeding 15 microns, and also uh, ultra black uh, with the levels of absorptance, uh, which uh, reaches uh, almost 100%. And uh, uh, according to the Kirchhoff law, which states that emissivity is equal to absorptivity, an absorbing uh, material like black silicon will be an excellent emissive material, which means that it is suitable for radiative cooling. Then, 
we need to take care about its wetting property. So uh, uh, here, as you can see, uh, these are uh, condensation laboratory experiments on a cool surface. And uh, if you take just a normal uh, flat uh, silicon surface, you still have this condensation uh, of, uh, of water, which is not uh, collected. It, and it takes time up to 90 minutes for those droplets to, to, to slide over the surface. And this is an issue. It, it needs to be improved. So, uh, uh, so in order to have the surface slippy, to have those uh, uh, droplets uh, sliding, the surface needs to be uh, slippy. And for this purpose, we need to minimize the hysteresis of the contact angle, which means that the receding contact angle needs to be almost equal to the advancing contact, uh, contact angle. And this was uh, found to be uh, attainable uh, by uh, coating the black silicon with uh, uh, some uh, Teflon-like uh, uh, ultra thin films. And at the end, uh, uh, it was proven to have at least 0 0.5 degree for this uh, hysteresis contact angle while keeping uh, this uh, high uh, number for uh, the contact angle, which means that this specific black silicon is an ideal candidate for a fast uh, sliding of droplets. And uh, uh, Xiaoyi is now harvesting, is now harvesting water, is working hard to uh, finalize this project. So uh, through this uh, uh, material, we, we, we saw that there is a kind of uh, opportunity to study a new class of optofluidic metasurfaces, which has not only optimal optical properties, but also optimal wetting properties. So uh, uh, in addition to the radiative cooling, so there are other uh, applications which requires both wetting and optical properties. Uh, and uh, one of these applications is uh, uh, photocatalysis. And th this, uh, this is uh, the last uh, part of my presentation is the kind of a crazy project trying to purify the outdoor uh, pollution of air. So uh, there, are, uh, there were uh, uh, already proven technology which are able to uh, purify indoor water, including uh, uh, environments of a car or, or at home. But here the challenge was to try to contribute to reducing the pollution outdoor, the pollution which is produced by traffic. So. The idea was to, uh, to here to use pavements uh, on the sidewalks and also in the road itself. And that's why it's called 5G road. Uh, and using photocatalytic materials uh, in order to uh, purify air, uh, water, and in the same time contribute to the reduction of the soil pollution. So all based on uh, putting uh, photocatalytic materials everywhere. Uh, and the candidate here, which has been selected, is zinc oxide nanowires. So, uh, so there was some uh, some uh, uh, processes that will have been developed to produce large surface areas of those functionalized uh, walls, and also asphalt road with aggregates functionalized with zinc oxide nanowires. And uh, there was this experiment done in Sun City. You know this climatic chamber that we have where we have solar lamp to emulate the sun. Uh, we controlled the pollutant and we measure the amount of those pollutants. And there was a proof that uh, those uh, materials uh, were uh, uh, proven to be efficient uh, to reduce uh, the uh, uh, NOx uh, pollutants. As you can see from this blue curve, the uh, reduction is much more efficient when we have uh, the materials compared to a reference experiments where we have no, uh, no, uh, this kind, no, not this kind of materials. Then uh, producing those uh, zinc oxide nanowires about such huge surfaces raises the, uh, uh, the question of having a proper characterization of their properties and the uniformity of the properties with no need to go uh, to the uh, SEM and make lengthy uh, characterization. So we came out with uh, this uh, technique, which allows a fast characterization of zinc oxide nanowires. And this is the title of uh, our paper that uh, the, both the length, the density, and the crystalline quality can be retrieved from a single optical spectrum. So uh, basically uh, in the spectrum, in the UV visible uh, area of uh, this uh, uh, zinc oxide nanowire, 
uh, what we can see here in this area is uh, uh, it, it, it is reflecting a kind of effective medium where depending on the density and the height of those uh, uh, nanowires, we'll be able to get information about the effective medium, which gives you basically information about the height and the density. Uh, in this part of the spectrum, which relates to absorption, the absorption, when we look carefully, it happens at different uh, 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 values of the band gap. And the band gap actually is a good indicator about the crystal quality. Uh, and uh, this has been checked by reference experiments using X-ray diffraction that shows that uh, the, this uh, red sample is better than the, the green one and the blue one. So uh, finally, uh, this, uh, uh, this was proven to be efficient for uh, a tool for process optimization as it, can, uh, it, can, it has been re uh, used to reveal homogeneity quite easily and fast on those uh, zinc oxide nanowires. Uh, last, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, other scale, we, we make this, uh, uh, this experiments of integrating zinc oxide nanowires into a microfluidic reactors. And the purpose uh, was multiple here. Uh, it, it, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, done for the purpose of uh, studying the kinetics of growth in such tiny environments. And in the same time, in, from application point of view, it was demonstrated to be efficient uh, for a purif purifying water. There are a lot of purification water, including desalination, but desalination, which is based on steam generation, uh, keeps the VOCs in the uh, clean uh, water because uh, VOCs are volatile. They, are, they, are, they can evaporate faster than water, actually, which means that they are still there after desalination uh, or after uh, steam generation. So there is a need to, for a last purification, which can be done by photocatalysis. And this has been proven uh, in uh, uh, this work that uh, we, uh, we published two years ago. And uh, by the way, uh, it was proven to uh, not only uh, efficient, but also very fast. And this was not very surprising because of the length scale, which is favorable for uh, uh, fast uh, diffusion uh, to bring the pollutants close to the uh, active uh, area of uh, the, the, the sidewalls. Uh, that's it. Uh, I finished my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. So yeah, now we came to the question part. I think we have uh, several questions here uh, for you. Uh, the first question is uh, Professor Tahik, wonderful talk. Uh, for the gas sensor by FTIR, is uh, really impossible for many applications. How about its cost compared with the commercialized product? And how about the reliability? Does it need to be calibrated openly? Uh, yes, this is an excellent question. So there are multiple questions here. So uh, the unit cost depends on the different generations that you saw uh, in, this, uh, in, in this presentation. So basically, the uh, the very first generation, uh, which was a handheld spectrometer, was uh, unit cost was in the order of a few thousand uh, euros. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after simplifying the architecture and putting it very, uh, much smaller, it became in the, in the order of 500. So uh, uh, th this, is, this is for the first question. Uh, regarding the reliability, uh, so MEMS is already proven to be very reliable uh, technology. It looks fragile, the mechanical parts, but uh, uh, it went the, the device went into uh, a thorough uh, uh, hard uh, environments uh, testing uh, to, uh, to survive uh, to shocks and uh, mechanical and uh, thermal uh, uh, constraints, and it was proven to be very reliable. And uh, regarding the calibration, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, a self-calibration capabilities that uh, uh, allows uh, to, uh, uh, at least in the horizontal scale, uh, to, there is no need to, to, uh, to tune uh, or to calibrate the, uh, the accuracy uh, of the, uh, the, the wavelength. Uh, for, 
Yes, I think I I answer to yeah. You all all, you cover all yeah. So yeah. I follow this criteria. I have a one is for the selectivity. So I mean for this kind of gas sensing and because if you want to detect the air, there are too many contents, right? So so for you, this technology is that very selective. Uh, hello. For the, uh, okay. Can you hear me? For the gas, right? If you want yeah. use in the uh, normal air, you didn't do any treatment about that samples. So normally there are too many content. Yeah. Yes. This is uh, so. Is how about the selectivity? Yes. Actually, selectivity uh, requires, in principle, selectivity requires a, a very low spectral resolution. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, we can go around uh, this issue by implementing machine learning algorithms. So if we have a typical uh, a set of pollutants that we know that we, we always found in the air, uh, like uh, uh, NOx and the VOCs and so on, so we can, uh, we can build a data database. And uh, uh, based on this database, even the spectral resolution is not uh, uh, very excellent. Uh, uh, we we can go around and uh, uh, have a, a quantification of each gas compounds. So it was already proven for uh, the uh, other application, which includes feed and uh, milk uh, analysis. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now we are working hard to uh, try to demonstrate the uh, the uh, applicability of this uh, uh, technique. Uh, to uh, to air quality and get the information about multiple uh, gas pollutants. So there are uh, multiple challenges in air quality. As I mentioned, this is not only a matter of selectivity, but also the lower limit of detection. According to the beer lumber law, we, we need a significant length uh, of the optical path of light to propagate and interact with the matter. So this is not uh, uh, this this is not uh, compatible with the scale of the sensor, which is not exceeding uh, a few millimeters. So uh, we need to find strategies to have this uh, path length uh, uh, exceeding uh, a few meters or uh, even a few tens of meters to to reach this lower limit of detections. So uh, here also we are working uh, in, in order to to find innovative solution to address this issue as well. Oh, it is great. Actually, I'm uh, so glad to hear you say that, you know, we not only need uh, to improve our hardware, we also need to work together with the software, right? Yeah, yes, this can help absolutely. a lot. Yeah, so now it's kind of a trend for the people moving this way. So the second question is, uh, uh, Professor Tatele, in one example, you mentioned the smart or precision agriculture or milk content. They just say that. Can you tell the information of a fresh or related information? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I did not cover all the applications because of lack of time, but uh, one of the key uh, applications uh, uh, targeting to reduce the uh, waste and also to avoid uh, uh, impact on health is to detect the freshness. Uh, so there was proven, uh, a proven uh, uh, applications uh, that, um, that demonstrate that we are able to detect the freshness of meat and also the ripeness of fruits and, and vegetables as well. Okay, great. Uh, so for the, uh, for the meat, the fresh one is uh, majority based on the color, right? Uh, actually, uh, there are some uh, specific chemicals. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I cannot go give all the details, but there, it's not only a matter of color. Uh, there is some, mm. some chemicals which develop uh. to the surface, which are mm. characteristics to meet biodegradation. And uh, uh, as, as, you, as you understood, there is a need for training uh, in this mm -hmm. uh, machine learning approach. And uh, uh, if, if we target, for example, uh, um, uh, a certain type of meat, so we need the training for this specific type of meat in order to be uh, efficient in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, quality okay. check. 
Yeah, great. That's very helpful because I'm thinking about the Kobe beef, right? The Kobe beef is the cost is much higher than others, right? More expensive. If we can detect that this was exactly the real Kobe beef, not a faker one, that would be more helpful because we yes. pay the price, right? Yeah, that's why example very, very nice. Yeah, uh, so yeah. The, the third We have another is, examples. Okay, we have another please. example of detect, detecting fraud uh, and the fake uh, regarding the silk, the silk, mm -hmm. uh, because there is pure silk and uh, fake silk, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it it was uh, it was easy to detect uh, the uh, the fake one. <laughs> oh, good, yeah. So this technology is very important for the you know common for the normal life, right? For the people using that. Especially now, most people, you know, do the online shopping, you know, buy everything. So they need to control the quality. Yeah. So the third question is for the air pollution map. I think it's at the very beginning you show that of yeah. Paris. Is the data took by the satellite in the space of the sensor network on the ground? So. Uh, neither space nor a sensor network. Uh -oh. So. Uh, it's called RCT, and you can find plenty of information uh, about uh, this project. It is a modeling, uh, a modeling uh, uh, work. So uh, it's uh, modeling oh, it's and simulation. Oh, it's not a real data, right? Oh, it's not a real data, right? It's not. It's, it's, uh, it's a simulation. It, it, it's it's simulation, but it has been validated uh, by real sensor uh, a network uh, over uh, Paris. To uh, make sure that the, this uh, simulated data give the uh, 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 the good results, at least for NOx, it was proven to be very efficient. But uh, this numerical modeling uh, took uh, take this uh, boundary condition and loading from real data, uh, which are measured. So this real data, including the weather, uh, including uh, the real traffic of the the cars in uh, in different. Uh, 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 parts of Paris. So this is real data that are uh, used to feed the numerical model so that the model will, will give realistic uh, information. And at the end, the, uh, the model has been validated uh, by comparing uh, its output with measured data uh, through a sensor network of more than 100 uh, uh, points uh, in, in Paris. Okay, great to know that details. Actually, at the first time I see that one, I think it's some pictures, you know, took from the satellite. I agree with that. It's first. Okay, great to know. I think in the future cities, you know, many, many of these kind of technologies will become out, will be used, even can protect, uh, protect uh, you know, the future's air pollution. Yeah. Yes, okay. this, this, exists, uh, this exists in other cities, uh, but uh, the specific feature of this uh, uh, simulation in Paris is that it has a three meter uh, resolution. Uh, it's, a, it's a very okay. high resolution. It yeah. is, and, three meters, my God. Yes, and the purpose uh, is, uh, uh, is to uh, use this kind of modeling for urban planning. So mm. uh, if there is a project to change uh, uh, the portion of the city, so you can make simulation uh, to anticipate what will be the behavior after uh, you, you, you finalize the construction. So it's a, a useful tool for urban planning, especially mm. young cities, yeah. Uh, I think older cities too, like in Beijing, if we have such kind of, you know, simulations, will be solve a lot of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. We came to the next question. Professor Takeda, you talk about the soil detection of a for the farmer. So my hometown is in Shandong, where it's uh, learning how to make a high quality wine from France. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, yeah, that's something happened there. I'm wondering whether we can use this technology to control the grape quality. The grape yeah. quality is good, is the best, you know, most important thing for the wine. So can they, can they use that technology to get better control? So uh, in, in principle, yes, but uh, this is a very complex uh, pro pr uh, problem. Uh, uh, quality uh, of wine is subjective, so you need to have a reference uh, for the quality. And uh, 
uh, if we if we if you are considering uh, uh, using uh, those uh, machine learning uh, approaches uh, combined with spectral sensing, you can uh, maybe monitor uh, reproducibility or. Uh, but in order to attain a certain goal uh, of quality, uh, which is based on reference, uh, I think there is a, there is a lot of know-how that needs to be uh, to be implemented. Uh, what you can do uh, is just to check whether you succeeded or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think your technology is more important for them because you know now in China, I think the wine from Europe, uh, you know, from uh, other kind of this famous space, the price is huge high, you know. Yeah, but the yeah. local wines, yeah, the price is not that high. Maybe based on the quality, they not high. So use your technology to detect the milk, you know, detect all these kind of things. It can help them to make a better wine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, we have another question to uh continue. Uh, Professor Tahik, uh, for using uh you know the oxide nanoware as function wall materials uh, should be in your last uh, you know, uh, session. How yeah. about the stability and the lifetime? Yes, uh, actually we are studying uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, indeed, uh, there is, a, there is a, um, a competing material which is titanium oxide and zinc oxide mm -hmm. is uh, is known uh, as uh, a potentially a more fragile material regarding uh, its stability, regarding uh, its stability and uh, sustaining uh, the pH, uh, uh, extreme pH values. So uh, we are uh, implementing some strategies to go around this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, problem. And uh, we will report soon about uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this topic. Yeah. Okay, great. We're looking forward to that. Really, a lot yeah. of new things you share today. So, and congratulations for your wonderful work. Uh, this is a certification you. for you by our ICAX Tats. Using your technology to connect the world and the universe. Yeah, wonderful job, Professor Tehik. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Alice. Uh, thank you again for giving me this opportunity to connect to the world and share what we are doing uh, in Paris and uh, uh, with uh, my network of collaborators. Thank you very much again. Okay, great. Yeah. So this was an uh, electrical version. Uh, yeah, I was sending you to by email, but uh, the you know the real version, the hard copy when we met. Okay, I've delivered to you. Okay, right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah, that's today's talk, Professor Tehik, and uh, you know, uh, really, really wonderful talk, thank you, wonderful talk. So what are we going to have next week? So next week is two beautiful ladies will get on the stage together. That's Evelyn from MIT. Yeah, I know Evelyn a long, long time since he, uh, she is a, a graduate school student. So now is already department chair at MIT. So it's really, really a silver star. And uh, Mona uh, Jahari, uh, she is from UCLA, uh, one of the most beautiful female scientists I ever met. So, and his uh, research, her research in the tellers is really amazing. She won a lot of awards too. So next week we will have these two uh, ladies, you know, female scientists to get on stage to share with us their research, you know, stories, uh, latest results. And our guest host will be Professor Gang Chen from MIT too. Uh, he's a superstar, yeah, for sure. And uh, I think we're going to share all the stories with, you know, this young Young ladies and uh, that's next Friday we will have and uh, next Friday we also have one thing very important because next Friday we are finished the my young scientist session so we're going to have the worst ceremony after that two uh, female scientists uh, Mona and uh, um, Evelyn's talk we will have half hours for the award ceremony so yeah you're going to see who will win the young scientist titles here so be sure to you know join the I can act next Friday we're going to have more you know story to share with you this was a uh, uh, mass conference you know uh, 2021 we're going to be online too. We'll be uh, take on the line and uh, next January 
uh, 25 to 29. So the submission of the abstract, the date was September 29. So be sure to save the date on your calendar and prepare your, you know, abstract, prepare the date and to join this wonderful conference. And uh, we promise we will provide you more things and uh, many, many more, you know, you can get online, you know, rather than go to, you know, some other conference. So be sure to come to, you know, our conference and save the day to submit your abstract. Uh, we're waiting for you there. That's I can ask every week, every day. Yeah, we're waiting for you here every Friday, you know, in the evening. Yeah, we have you on this virtual conference, on this online global science talk. So I can ask, connect the world and the universe, connect you and me. Okay, see you next week. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Point, uh, uh, hello. What was what was the subject of uh, the previous oh, no, question? No. Uh, just now, no, Dayj no. and me were. I was asking Dayj. Yeah, because now you know the one you know. Uh, was killed in the U.S. by the policeman. Oh, you remember oh, that? I see, I see. Yeah. So I see. Black Lives Matter, yes. right? It's a topic yes, yes, in the whole I, world. I got it.